Hey y'all, welcome to the County Trapping School Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Pope. In this episode, I am going to do kind of a review and a how to get uh, what the elusive Hoofbeats of a Wolfer book. Um, so if you haven't heard of this, um, you will now. If you've been trapping very long, you've probably heard of Craig O'Gorman. He is a uh, big time professional western trapper, has been trapping since the late, or I guess, been trapping since the 70s at least. Uh, started professional trapping, um, so to speak, in the late 70s in uh, Montana. So he lives in Montana and uh, to this day, I think he still operates a uh, his predator control business and, and largely and this is this is just what I get from from the book and all I'm not personally talked to Mr. Gorman but um, you know, he provides predator control for it, at least in the early years mainly sheep ranches um, I think that's something that used to be probably bigger than it is now but um, you know coyotes especially can definitely take down sheep a lot easier than they can cows uh, or cattle and so um, that's what he I mean that's how you know he built his business, built his trapping reputation is um, by trapping 365 days a year, um, day in and day out, and making sure that he kept predator losses for those sheep ranchers down. And uh, so, first thing is, everybody wants to know how do you get the book? And that's uh, that's kind of the tricky and honestly from, from my perspective from a kind of a modern day perspective um, a little bit aggravating frustrating because there's no website no online presence no social media um, Mr. Craig O'Gorman is very old school traditional and uh, so he's strictly catalog and actually um, if you want a catalog you have to, if you never, never haven't placed an order with them, you have to uh, send uh, $7 to them to get a catalog, and then that, that $7 is fully refundable. Once you place an order, it'll be refunded through your order, um, and then you'll receive, um, if, you, if you receive a, if you place an order, you'll get a catalog. So if you wanted to just call up and say, hey, you know, I want to order a piece of a woofer, um, then you'll get a catalog with that order, presumably. So I sent off and uh, got my $7, got my catalog. And, I mean, the catalog is, is like a magazine in itself. I mean, it's no no wonder. I, and I, I honestly, I mean, I can't blame them. You know, I know it's got to be it's, it's got to be expensive to just print these catalogs and send them out to, to anybody that wants them. And so uh, I, I kind of get it from that standpoint. And, and his is, I mean, his... He doesn't sell any anybody else's things. It's, it's strictly O'Gorman, and it's uh, I mean, it's 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 slammed full of, of pictures, uh, testimonials from users, from students who have taken personal instruction from him, uh, and from you know kind of what he has available. Honestly, it, it's kind of um, it's it's hard to keep up with, um, just because you got you know all these boxes. Uh, here we got snare bait, high desert coyote bait. Powder River Paste bait you've probably seen, um, and then you know if you flip to the back, well here's a bunch of testimonials. Well here's the Coon Dagger, uh, Badger Gland, a Gorman Dirt Bag, uh, and <laughs> honestly, from my standpoint, it, it's a little bit confusing just because I like in a in a catalog when I'm ordering something, man, I like to see you know bullet point. <laughs> These are the lures, you know, it, or um, you know everything kind of consolidated together and it's it's just kind of a um, you got snare parts so it's it's a little um, there's a lot there um, so that's uh, that's the gist you and I, I'll put I'll put the information it's uh, it's on the back here Gorman Enterprises box 491 number one Cougar Canyon Road Brodus Montana and uh, that's where you send your seven dollar check or you can call up and if you place an order with them like I said if you know that you want to go ahead and order the book you can call up and say hey I'd like to order um, Hoof Beats of a Wolfer and they'll send you a catalog with it so um, 
and I think, and I, I, I kind of, like I said, it's, it's kind of, it's been frustrating, or it was, it was kind of frustrating because, you know, there's a, there's a lot of mystique and a lot of few folks talk about the, the book, but then if you just type in hoofbeats of a wolfer, you can't find it, you know, and so it's, where, where, how do, where do I, do I get this? Um, but in talking with Jeremiah Wood, when I was on his podcast, the Trapper Today podcast, if you're not listening, listen in because he's got a good show. But, uh, you know, we talked about uh, marketing strategy and, his, you know, maybe that's, uh, that's kind of his marketing strategy. And uh, I, from that perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I can, I can kind of see and it, it kind of intrigues me that, uh, you know, thinking about it from that perspective of, you know, building even more um, kind of word of mouth and, and mystery and mystique and, and uh, you know, driving interest, hopefully increasing interest. I mean, it interested me enough to, to want to get it more. So, um, and, and I'm sure especially because um, this Hook Beats of a Wolf was first written in 1990. And so in those days, you know, everything was old school. And, and he may have even he may have even sent out free catalogs in those days. I'm not sure, um, but uh, I think from the from the marketing perspective, it's kind of interesting. He's got some a, a few other things, uh, like one of the one of the things on the on the page that that outlines hoof beats of a wolf for the book and how to order it. Um, in every update and on every book, it says or on the on the book it says not sold within 300 miles of Barotus, Montana, which is where he lives. And uh, so, you know, that, um, and, and he talks about in the book of, of going in and trapping for folks and then, you know, having them want to ride along or coming and looking at his sets and, and then, uh, you know, not, once he gets done, not hiring them again and then come find out there, you know, trying to out there trying to trap on their own or copying his sets and things. So, uh, no doubt he's been kind of burnt by folks in the past that have, um, you know, kind of copied him, especially in his local area. And uh, when your when your bread and butter is catching coyotes, um, I can kind of understand holding, hold, especially holding a few cars close to your vest um, within within your area where you're making a living at. So from that standpoint, I get it. Um, kind of got off on a tangent there, but um, so the book Hoof Beats of a Wolfer, and here it is right here. Uh, I don't know if you can see my stupid dog. He came on a weekend we weren't here, and I, I got it. Uh, it's been several months ago, and now thankfully he's kind of gotten out of the chewing stage. But I also got one of the updates, and he got it pretty good. Nevertheless, Hoof Beats of a Wolfer, um, it is. It, it's a it's a jam-packed book. I mean, it's uh, 196 pages, and I mean, it's compared to any of the other trapping books you see. There, there's really no comparison. You know, um, I grew up and started trapping. Well, I should have grabbed one, but you know, with the little kind of pamphlet style books, more or less. I mean, you know, they're you know kind of like the size of this legal pad, maybe 20 pages, um, and kind of just a, a high high level overview. Um, kind of hitting the high points. I mean, this book this book gets into a lot of detail. I mean, if you're if you're interested at all in, in coyote trapping, serious coyote trapping, and, and especially I would say a, a little bent toward western coyote trapping, uh, just because that's where he operates and, and that's that's what he does day to day. Um, it's worth it's worth purchasing. Now the book itself is forty five dollars and fifty cents, and then it costs sixteen dollars to ship. So. It's a it's a substantial investment, eh, but like I said, I mean, you look at the the other little trapping books that are twelve or ten bucks um, for you know a book half this half this size and a tenth the pages versus a two hundred page book. Um, I don't know that it's unrealistic. It's more than you expect to pay for a trapping book. I I hundred percent grant you that, but. Um, from my perspective, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go through through briefly, kind of some of the high points, but it's it's worth it to get. Um, don't don't have any over expectations about. Um, I hesitate to say quality. I, I guess quality of the publication. Um, you know, I, I can't necessarily fault uh, Mr. Craig because he's a 
trapper probably more so than a writer. There's some there's some um, grammar and spelling issues, and um, you know sometimes it's kind of jumps from um, topic to topic without uh, it's kind of a little bit hard to follow. Um, one thing that really disappointed me, and, and I part of it's just from when this was first produced. There's a lot of pictures in the book, um, but they're all black and white, and they're, it's it's really tough to get um, to get very much of a sense of what you know what's going on in the pictures, which is is really dis really disappointing me because um, yeah, I feel like that's a, that's definitely a, a potential of, of learning a lot. But there again, I mean this this book was printed. <laughs> 30 years ago, and they didn't have the photograph technology and, and the printer technology, or the, the book was first published. Um, so um, it would be very extensive, I'm sure, to, to replicate all those with you know updated updated information. Um, so overall, the book itself is is definitely um, it's worth worth the money. A little bit about. Uh, like I said, Mr. Craig O'Gorman's history, and he, he kind of talks about, he kind of hits it off and on um, how he got into trapping as a youngster in the Midwest, started trapping foxes, and then got interested in trapping coyotes, and then wound up going, um, taking some instruction. I have to, it's, it's been such a such a large book, and it took me so long, I'll have to read it again, and that's one of the things, I mean, there's enough in here that it definitely warrants multiple reading. And uh, so the next round that I go through, I'm gonna have um, sticky notes and a highlighter because I, I I got about halfway through and I was like, man, I should have been taking I should have been taking notes or something because um, there there really is just so much information. It's hard to it's hard to kind of take it all in. Um, but then he went to uh, Powder River County, is where he ultimately wound up, and uh, that's where he uh, presumably still lives, trapping coyotes primarily. And uh, not only trapping coyotes, but uh, I guess uh, pursuing them in any way possible. So he talks about denning. He talks about using M44s and getter guns, uh, aerial gunning. Um, I'm not sure if it's in here. I remember one of my old trapping buddies. He had a, a VHS tape, and I think he actually sells VHS tapes in here. But um, it was a VHS tape called Death from Above, and it's a it's video of aerial gunning out of an airplane. Um, Coyotes, pretty pretty cool. It's again, it's it's old, and you know you get that feel. It's not the same as watching something on HD or 4K on your flat screen TV anymore. But uh, pretty interesting. But anyway, that's been that's been his his life is is targeting, trapping coyotes, uh, calling coyotes, denning coyotes, killing coyotes, and and especially and and I think one of the keys to the keys to, to his profession and the predator control man or nuisance trapper's profession is, is targeting specific coyotes. You know, you're not, when, when, when a farmer's got coyotes killing, sh killing sheep, he's not necessarily out to catch all the sheep. He's out to catch the sheep killing coyotes. He's not out, excuse me, I said that wrong. He's not necessarily out to catch all the coyotes. He's out to catch the sheep killing coyotes. That or the sheep killing coyote because a lot of times it may be just a single or a pair. Um, but there's some, I mean, there's some pretty impressive pictures in, through here of, of uh, here's here's a picture on the hoofbeats of a wolfer page, part of a 1100 predator animals uh, taken in the winter of 83 84, and it's just coyotes spread out. I mean, it's you read through this book and there's no doubt the man knows what he's talking about. He's got lots of experience. Um, and to some extent, he's not bashful about telling you. And in part of, in one of the part of the book, he uh, talks about that he wrote the best fox book out there, the best fox book at the time, uh, fox trapping book. And so uh, some of the things that he kind of hits on in the book, and, and I'm, I'm barely breaking the surface because I mean, 196 pages. It's a lot of a lot of stuff, and, and gets into pretty pretty good detail. He's very big on a lot big foot old traps, and of course, he came up in the time when the Long Springs and the, the Victor Three Ends 
for the, the Cadillac trap. Um, but the bigger is better. He talks about using number four new houses and, and large traps. It even shows some pictures, large, um, strong traps. It even shows some pictures of coyotes caught by the, the elbow or by the forearm. I mean, pretty impressive catches. You know, I've never seen anything like that. Pretty impressive to think of, uh, you know, a, a trap holding a coyote by the forearm or the elbow. Uh, and you can see how, I mean, there's... And the MB550s that I run, there's not enough room in the jaws really to make that feasible. Um, but he talks about, you know, coats, um, I want to say kind of like crawling into a set or working a set on the side or something like that and getting caught. Um, and, and that's just a, a neat way to think about, you know, sometimes you get those fire traps and, you know, you don't think about what was that coat, how that coat was working the set or, you know, what, what might have trip the trap it might not have been a paw um, but I mean in some of those cases it's possible to get those coats if you got the right equipment it talks a lot about equipment that's that's a I mean that, obviously that's the uh, that's that's what you got that's that's what either makes or breaks you your equipment and, and how you use it he also talks about using large pans and steel screen pan covers so not a fan of fiberglass at all even the fiberglass um the fiberglass screen he talks about the the odor and the smell of that and you know he's, he's heavy on the steel screen pan covers and large pans talks about some studies and one of the things he does often is referring to different studies from different studies and different articles written by some of the old-time government trappers and so i guess you could kind of kind of say that the pioneers of the coyote trapping and coyote um, pursuing and it, it gives a lot of credit to those guys some of those guys that, that he learned from and got started uh, Vern Dorn, Charlie Robbins um, several western coyote trappers that really kind of paved the way and, and got to the, uh, the the coyote game and the, and the predator control game doing when it started and, and probably eased his learning some of, of uh, being able to see, being able to read how they did it, what they did, and and the government. I mean, that was a, that was a time that the government was probably putting a lot of money into coyotes, um, into research, and into, I mean, they had programs uh, a lot bigger than we what would be equivalent to USDA Wildlife Services. Uh, I think back then they may have been called USDA um, Animal Damage Control (ADC) agents. Um, that were that was again that was their job. They were government trappers that were out there. For, for the benefit of the, the cattlemen and the livestock um, runners that were a lot of those guys running running livestock on public ground, I assume. And um, so it's, it's neat to see, and, and it gives reference to a lot of those articles, and that would be something that I would like to try to go back and, and look up and see if I could find some of those articles. Um, and that's one thing that he talks about is you know, the large pans, like the expanded pans that I've been using uh, and, and playing with talks about some of those old time trappers doing things to, to increase their pan surface area to to try to increase their catches and get better catches and so that's I mentioned that before but that's something that I want to kind of tinker more with with those expanded pans and, and, and put more of those on my traps see how that goes like I said there's a, there's a lot of information actually I meant to go get it I actually ordered a book that he referred to actually I, uh, I can look it up because I ordered it through Amazon beauty of Amazon is I can see my order history. Um, here we go. Orders. It's a book called Coyotes, Predators and Survival Survivors by Charles L. So French looking name Cadia, C-A-D-I-E-U-X. Um, it's a book that he recommends learn, you know, delving into coyote biology and behavior and, and that's I think that's a key to a lot of it was is you know learning everything you can about the, the animal that you're pursuing and you know to make you better at pursuing that animal and, and keying in on um, triggers or things that give you an advantage another thing that I found really interesting was he, he talked about the large catches and he, and he talks about you know there's there's two brothers can't remember their names. There's two brothers in uh, that were in Washington. I want to say 
that uh, he mentioned several times, I say catching like a thousand coyotes in three months or in trapping season. I should have looked that up. Um, it's pretty impressive. He mentioned he mentioned those guys uh, a couple times. And one of the things he talked about is, you know, all the conditions have to be right to, to get that. You have to have a large coyote population to start with. And then some of the weather weather patterns, you know, you got to have weather that cooperates, allowing your sets to work and, and uh, different things. Uh, one of the, to me anyways, one of the keys in kind of reading through his um, descriptions of some of those large catches, and he even points out that having multiple day checks is is a big component so and I, I may not be saying that exactly right but you know being able to go three I think in, in you know in his experience even five or six days between trap checks and obviously that kind of makes a lot of sense because um, you know you're gonna catch a lot more you know probably not that unheard of if you got 100, 150, 200 traps out, and you're running them every three days. You know you could, you could, catch, you could have big catch days doing that because you're not out there running them every day, and you know taking your, you know, a couple coyotes a day, and when you run them and you got 10 or 12 coyotes, um, you know because, you know those traps haven't been checked in several days, and so that was one thing, at least. To me, in looking at some of the older, and, and I've seen, you know, I follow enough guys on Instagram that, that do, um, that are out west and do coyote calling competitions and all. I mean, there's areas that just are loaded with coyotes. Um, so, from that perspective, man, I can, I can see where some of that, uh, some of that is realistic to have, you know, maybe a 24 hour trap check or, or 48 hour trap check and still have big numbers of catches. That was that was one thing that I hadn't really thought of before, that um, you know having those, and, and he 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 gets to talking about the, I guess the, for for lack of a better word, accounting or financials of of his business of, of trapping of of professional trapping, and talking about you know the 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 all the added expense of you know chicken traps every day versus chicken traps. You know, having three or four days to check, you know, maybe run a different line um, every couple of days versus and, and the added expense, and that makes a whole lot of sense, you know, just from my standpoint of, you know, 24 hour check. I know the gas that I'm burning every day running those traps, and I'm not advocating extending trap checks, um, but I'm not advocating against it either. I uh, understand, I mean, especially in big country like that. Where um, you're covering a lot of ground, you, it's it's hard. Honestly, it's hard for me as an Eastern trapper to really wrap my head around um, Western coyote trapping and, and being able to trapping a hundred thousand acre ranch. I mean, I, that just that just baffles my mind. You know, make you, the idea that you can make you know three huge loops. You know, around the ranch, never crossing the same track twice, and you know, setting traps the whole way, uh, and and still not cover all the ground. I mean, that that's kind of hard for me to comprehend, hard for me to wrap my head around. Um, and and I'll, I'll be honest, man. One thing that really intrigued me about this book is just that consistent pursuit of of, of coyotes of of one animal. You know, that's that's what drove and drives his life is. Is how can I get better? How can I make sure that I'm not leaving, um, you know, leaving one last one, getting every one, and you know, how can I every day, every day seeking to get better? I don't, that just, that really, it, from one standpoint, I can see where it, it may kind of lose a little bit of its uh, grandeur, or whatever, you know, of going out, you know, Christmas Day and running traps, and you know it. It's different when you have to versus you want to, I guess. And so, from that standpoint, you know, I, in some respects, the idea of running, you know, being a, a professional trapper and running a long line and, and that being your bread and butter, it sounds idealistic and and a really uh, 
neat thing to do. And, and from the other side, I like enjoying trapping and I don't want to turn it into work. And so that's, um, that's another, and, and that's one, one of the things that I kind of, almost kind of wanted to take, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Take issue with is, is he writes, he mentioned multiple times about guys and, and he specifically says, and I don't, I don't feel like it's, I don't feel like it's the reality that he makes it out to be, but, um, you know, he talks about folks that, you know, make six figures. He, he, that's what he consistently says, make six figures at another job and are trapping for two weeks or three weeks out of the year, trapping just for fun and, um, kind of, he was talking more from the standpoint of watching out for those guys that are doing that and, and also selling instruction or selling, um, you know, selling products and, and, and selling themselves as a, you know, very experienced trapper versus himself of 365 days a year. This has got to pay the bills. I got nothing else that's covering the, you know, this, this, this making a house payment this month. And, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think a lot's changed since, and, and even, I, I'll get into that, but, you know, I think the reality nowadays is there's a lot more people that are the recreational type trapper than there are professional trappers. Um, just, just from the, I guess the economics or the, the, the industry, the markets, um, you know, fur market's not there for, for guys to, in my opinion, to make a living off fur. It, not in my opinion, it's not, it's not there. Um, even, even state hopping, things like that. I mean, there's, there's, the market's just not there. And so there's a lot of other folks that, um, you know, and I think that's why you've seen some of the professional trappers, they, they branched out and, you know, selling baits and lures and they're doing what they can to supplement that. And, you know, a lot of those guys, the Western guys, they, they work with sheep ranchers and, and things. And, you know, they also got that nuisance side of the business, you know, so they're not, they're not strictly fur trapping, you know, they're fur trapping for a few months out of the year. They're also nuisance trapping. They've got a lure and bait and supply business and you know, they're making, they're putting a lot of these things together. Um, so that was yet another one of my tangents. I guess y'all maybe are getting used to my tangents there, but I, I don't know. I guess that, that kind of rubbed me wrong. It was kind of, in, in my impression, in my opinion, kind of putting, um, I felt like he was putting the hobby trapper down. Um, and maybe I'm reading into that more as feeling like he was pointing a finger at me because, you know, I am, I'm putting, I, I hesitate to say instructional stuff out there, but I, in reality, that's what I am. I'm, I'm putting, you know, how-to things out there. And I guess from my perspective, I'm not saying that I'm an expert. I've never said, I don't think, I've never said that I'm an expert trapper. I'm just a coyote trapper. I can catch coyotes and I want to show people if they're wanting to know how to catch coyotes. I've got a, my ways that I can catch them with, and I'm more than happy to share them with you and help you to catch coyotes too. So um, that's just my perspective. Like, a, and, and I think uh, Mr. O'Gorman is, from some aspects and some folks may be con a little controversial because of kind of the stances that he's taken. Um, he talks a lot about the copy boys, and it's kind of along those same lines of folks that are, you know, maybe ripping off some of his material or, you know, some, some other, the more well-known trapper material and, and, you know, making like they're the best trapper out there and they know everything. And I don't think it, it's as big of an issue as it's made out there. Nevertheless, I don't, don't want to take that to detract from the book. Um, <laughs> we'll keep on rolling. Um, so where we got off going with that was we we're talking about multiple day catches and uh, so anyway that was one of the interesting points that I took away was you know you see in and I don't know if it's as common nowadays as it used to be but you know you see those old pictures of you know pile of coyotes stacked up and you know barn walls full of coyotes pasted up there and uh, that presumably is a key element to that 
one of the major factor, one of the large factors in producing a lot of coyotes is having multiple days to check traps, multiple, I'm saying that wrong, but not having to check traps every day or every two days, being able to let the traps soak and probably covering more ground in between there. Another thing that I thought was real interesting was talk, in talking about the different staking options, uh, you talk about drags and the idea of drags being less stressful on an animal um, because an animal can get off into cover and then also kind of, you know, if, if it gets caught up or wrapped in some small brush or, or small trees, so to speak, I guess, and things that, you know, kind of act like a shock spring. And as he's pulling on the, on the drag, you know, if it's a, a smaller tree sapling or something like that, that, that tree may be giving. And uh, so, you know, kind of less, I guess, less stress potentially on the, on the, the trap leg because you got kind of a built-in shock spring there and also the animal can get out of, you know, is not out in the open, but kind of get off and hit and then brush. I thought that was really interesting, and especially as I've, you know, kind of tinkered with drags a little bit more over the last couple of years. Um, obviously, drags aren't a good option everywhere. And one of the things he talks about is, is having, you know, anybody that's a good trapper that's running a lot of drags behooves you to have a good trap dog, a trap line dog that can take off on those drags and, and track down uh, a catch, especially if it goes very far. For whatever reason, things don't catch just right and he's able to make off of that drag farther than you expect. One of the things, of, I say of course, um, he talks about the, the Mafia set, which is kind of, a, uh, which is a set that O'Gorman came up with and it's really, it's a, it's a neat set, it's kind of a, a subtle set and he talks about using it as, as uh, catching kind of hard to catch coyotes or, or uh, maybe educated coyotes and uh, I made a video on it but it, it's in essence talking about having a trail and just putting a dropping some scat at one place setting your traps on e either side in the trail of the dropping and maybe freshen the dropping up with some urine and that's it just enough that you slow that that coat down for just a minute while he, excuse me, while he's on that trail. So he stay, takes the time to stop, smell that dropping, maybe hike his leg. Um, that's a, I wish that we had more clearly defined coyote trails here. Uh, that's something I've tinkered with a little bit, but um, I think that there's no doubt that's a, that's a, a, a really good set. It just makes a lot of sense, especially from the standpoint of you're not using, um, you're using natural type stuff, so to speak. And that kind of plays into another thing that he talked about with bait and the, I guess the importance, especially if you're trapping the same areas over and over, the importance of mixing up and, and burying the bait and lure that you use. Because, and I've talked about it before, you know, I've seen, in my experience, you know, a little goes a long way from the standpoint of those coyotes can smell it better than we think that they can, you know. You put a spoonful of bait down a hole, you can leave it there for a month, let it get rained on multiple times. A coyote comes by, wind catches him, he, he, he senses it, he can still smell that and come check it out. And so from that standpoint, you know, even on, you know, areas where you're trapping, you pull your traps, you know, you were there two weeks, you pull your traps and you're gone, that bait's still down that hole, those lures are still there. So those coyotes that are running through that property, they may be checking that out when you know your traps are not there, and so it may not hold the same. You know, if you're using bait, yeah, maybe your bait will draw them in from a from a hunger standpoint, but it you know it may not have the same appeal or your curiosity appeal that it would if it's a brand new smell. So I like, especially myself, I, I do kind of trap some of the same farms in same areas. And so I, I thought that was a really interesting takeaway, uh, really important. Another thing that I really liked was the idea, he talks about the idea that coyotes can sense the amount of bait that's in a hole. And so, you know, a coyote may be more inclined to work a set if he can, and, and I don't, I, I haven't done any research into this, but if a coyote can smell that there's, I don't really know a, a good way to. He mentions in the in the in the 
in the book actually using his trowel and scooping out bait and putting bait in the in the hole of this trowel. Now, personally, I kind of filed that away in my mind as well. He's also selling lure and bait, so he could be trying to sell more bait. Um, but I, I do like the idea. So what I was getting at is, you know, if you're using a trowel full of bait versus a spoonful of bait, can and I, I don't know the answer to this, but can that cow smell and realize that there's more? bait in the trowel hole than there is the spoon hole and maybe he's more inclined to work that trowel hole because there's more bait it's more worthwhile versus working you know working that hole for you know bite versus working that hole for part of a meal I, I, that really intrigues me and uh, from that standpoint you know that's that's had me thinking and i've been doing my hog trapping and so one thing that i'm i want to try i've never personally i've never really been interested in trying to make baits and lures and especially now it seems like there's a lot of folks you know coming out with their own baits and lures and, and there's, there's plenty of good stuff on the market but from the aspect of using a larger quantity of bait that intrigues me in making my own because you know bait's not cheap to buy um, and you know using a, even using a fresh bait so I've got hogs now uh, you know I've got some beaver and and you know I, on occasion, I, I get a summertime beaver trapping job, so that can provide me more beaver. Um, you know, deer deer trimmings from processing deer. So that's one thing that I, I am interested in doing, and, and I intend to do this uh, this coming season is try to have some some batches of my own, just just meat. You know, nothing really added to it, but just batches of my own meat bait. And, and I talked about that with Steve Wright in the in the last um, last podcast. You know. He talked about just jamming that hole full of bait. Um, and, and that's something that I'm definitely interested in wanting to try. Um, and that just that idea really intrigues me. Um, so be looking for that in the future because that's something I'm going to try. Um, kind of making my own fresh bait and, and using that and seeing how, you know, a load of, you know, pack full of dirt hole versus a spoonful of dirt hole, how that performs. Then he talked about some of the old timers, you know, back in the 20s, 30s, there wasn't, a whole, there wasn't all the commercial uh, baits and lures that, that are available now. He talked about those guys using fish, which is something that we, and I don't, I don't think they got possums in Montana and the Dakotas and all, so maybe that's a little bit different than us down here in the southeast, but, um, you know, definitely... I could see fish being an attractant for you know any predator that's that's out in the woods. Um, they also talked about the a state to prairie dog set as being a kind of a staple for some of those guys, and just and, and I guess kind of a segue. One of the sets he talked about is a state hide set, and so you know taking a square of some kind of hide, deer, beaver, um, skunk, whatever, driving a stake in that hide and putting a trap on it, and that. That's something I definitely want to try. And I guess kind of my takeaway to some of this is maybe maybe tra as trappers we sometimes overthink and uh, want to make things a little bit harder than they really need to be. Um, you know, and, and that's one of the things, especially with the, kind of the, the harder ground that I've got, is I'm always looking for some ways that I can make life easier versus digging a dirt hole in hard red clay, um, but still be as effective. And, and I could see, you know, a steak piece of, even like rabbit or squirrel maybe you know something that stake to the ground that's going to get maybe a little gland lure a little uh, food lure some kind of lure to get their attention too but i can i can see that presumably it being something that uh that a cow would definitely stop and work so that's another thing that i'm going to try kind of wrapping up one of the other things that he talked about that, that intrigued me was trap rip and he talked about really there's no need to if you get a dozen fresh traps, go out and set them things. Unless you're using antifreeze, you know, the salt base that would cause them to rust faster, go out, set them and trap with them until they get a coat of rust on them, and then, you know, dye them and wax them. Um, not, he's not a fan of the gas based dips at all. And so that, that's another thing that factored into my thoughts on going back to dyeing versus speed dip this year. Um, but one thing that I would like to do is order a dozen new traps and use them just like he talks about just right out of the box. I was actually talking to somebody just last week that talks about you know we were talking about trap prep and all he's like I just 
you know, wash mine off and go with them. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't dye them and wax them every year. I just they go like they are and catch coats. And so um, I think that would be a really neat experiment to just take a dozen fresh craps right out of the box, put a stake and a tag on them, and go set them and see what happens. So uh, another thing, I, I picked up a lot to. A lot from this book that I that I want to try to implement this this uh, coming season. So, and, and lastly, in his 2017 updates, I also ordered. So one thing I skipped over. So you got hoofbeats of a wolfer, printed in 1990. There's also been he's he's over the years since it's been originally published. He he's made several updates. So also included in the book are the 92 and 2003 updates. There was also a 95 and a 96 snare update that that's not included. You have to purchase those separately. And then a 2006 and then this 2017 update that has to be purchased separately. And uh, you cannot purchase any of the updates unless you own Hoofbeats of a Wolfer. So I purchased the 2017 update. This was 2750 plus posted. So with postage and all, I'm pushing 100 bucks into, into uh, Hoofbeats of a Wolfer and updates. but. Like I said, I mean, it's, if, if catching coyotes rattles around in your mind very much and, you know, that's something that you think a lot on, it's, it's definitely worth the investment, um, in my opinion. One of the things, the way he closes out, closes out the 2017 update, and, and I thought it was kind of interesting to touch on, but it's called The End of an Era, and the first paragraph says, I could write a whole book on how pre on how predator control could and should be run, but the country has changed and I see little future in rural predator control. What I got to do and live will never be again. It was an era and is over just like the mountain men at the Green River Rendezvous. Um, and he talks a little bit more about uh, the things that are going into, you know, the kind of the decline of the predator control era, I guess you could say, from... Um, livestock shifts from sheep to cattle and regulations to more stringent trap check laws and things like that um, and then also the fur market um, you know it's definitely something that in good fur fur years could be a significant supplement to, to a professional trapper's income a pro, uh, what do you call predator control trappers income and the fur market is just I mean right now there's there's a good market for coyotes but that could that could change tomorrow you know with the fur market the ups and downs um, and, and one thing that he talks about is feral hogs and how the government you know at one time the government was putting a lot of money towards coyote control and catching coyotes and reducing coyote numbers well now a lot of that money is going toward feral hog control and, and figuring out about this old feral hog issue. Like we've seen with the, the videos that I've done on the, the Jaeger Pro trap that I've got that came from grant money to from, from the government to put towards this feral hog issue. So, um, you know, as much as I hate to hate to, to read that, hate to think that myself, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of legitimacy to that. You know, even from... You know, from the southern perspective of predator control for, for wildlife management, you know, there was, uh, I'd say the last 10 years there's been a lot of talk around how predators are impacting deer populations and, and more so than we realize, and, and not necessarily predators, but coyotes, maybe impacting deer populations more than we realized. And, um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of people that were willing to, to pay to for predator control, predator removal, uh, and, and there's no doubt there's still folks out there that are willing to do that. But you know, if you got the money to spend on predator control versus habitat management or something like that, you know, there's places where you can get more bang for your buck. And and I don't personally, I don't really feel like the predator control as much as I would like to say, you know, predator control is the the um, the ticket, I guess, to improving wildlife populations. Unless you've got a, several other things, boxes checked, of things that you're doing, it can be a waste of your money. And I think some people, you know, people are, that's becoming more mainstream and people are focusing more on 
you know, what kind of habitat work and stuff that they can do because predator control is a year. I mean, that's, that's the same thing that, that he's facing too is, you know, those sheep ranchers, you catch some coyotes, it's not going to be long. There's going to be more coyotes there. And I mean, it's a, it's a constant thing. And whereas ranchers, you know, sheep are costing them, you know, losing a sheep costs X amount of money, losing a couple deer in reality, not necessarily costing somebody at least out of pocket. So, um, just, um, just some thoughts. I mean, this this industry trapping as a whole is constantly changing and evolving, and um, who knows <laughs> who knows where it's going to go next. And how, I mean, heck, I, I talk about that, say that, and then you know, I don't think it's passed. But South Carolina was talking about putting a bounty on coyotes. So. You never know. You never know how this, you know, what, because, and one of the things that he talks about is politics, the politics of coyotes and, and human wildlife interaction, the human wildlife conflict, that, that's always changing too. So, as a wrap up, um, if you're interested, truly interested, and want to shell out 50 bucks to uh, learn more about coyote trapping and, and coyotes in general, I think it's, it's definitely a worthwhile, a uh, worthwhile investment. Uh, if, you're, if you're serious about trapping, predator trapping, and want to improve your, your game, like I said, there's don't expect don't expect a uh, super over the top finished book. But if you want a book that you can read several times and get something out of it every time, and something that's going to help you uh, to catch more coyotes, I, I think Oak Beats of a Wolfer is definitely one that'll do that. So I would encourage you if you're interested to purchase the book and I will post information on how to purchase the book um, on I'll put it in a, a uh, slide at the end of this program so you should be looking at it right now I'll also make a little post on the website Cody Travis School about Hope Beats Over Wolfer uh, how to get hold of it and, and so that will conclude today's show I hope y'all are having a good summer hope you've gotten some fishing in or something I've gotten very little of that in but um Next week, we're going doing a little camping camping trip and hopefully get some fishing and crabbing in on that. So I'm pretty excited about that. I hope y'all are enjoying your summer, enjoying the kiddos, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Thanks for watching.